No, you don't. Don't. I, I, yes. Here. Yes. It's like. I got an idea. Saudi Arabia and the Takfir in Islam and he did a lot of research and papers on ISIS, Takfir, politics of Takfir. Takfir is, uh, is excommunication of Muslims or pointing them as disbelievers. It's been used as a political tool for centuries and it was developed for also centuries, been used by government, jihadist groups, and recently by the so-called Islamic State, or also known as Daesh, IS, Islamic State in Iraq and Shah, and many others, other names. Um, I'd like also to introduce myself. I am Omar Muhammad, uh, the founder of Musulai. I was known until recently as Musulai to the world, until I revealed my identity in December 2000. 17. I lived in Mosul. I witnessed uh, the occupation of ISIS or the so-called Islamic State. I lived under the rule two years, reporting from inside the city about what's happening in Mosul. I also witnessed how takfir was used by ISIS, and I don't want to talk about takfir now. I'll leave it to Paul to talk about it, but my experience with Takfir is I used, I witnessed the practicing of Takfir by the Jihad since 2003 until the fall of ISIS in Mosul in 2017. Um, thank you, Omar. Uh, thanks to the ISIS Institute for having me. I definitely didn't think uh, a year ago I would be sitting next to Mosul. <laughs> let alone know who he is, so it's a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, I really want to report what you've done as a um, My experience is, of course, very different. I've never been to Mosul. lived in Syria, but well before the Islamic State was around. Um, so all of my research on, on this subject is really drawn from the internet, and primarily from the messaging uh, platform Telegram. And it's Telegram that is the, the main platform that the jihadis Islamic State uses to disseminate its material and to communicate among itself. So, 
Uh, that's just kind of a caveat at door. That's where I'm kind of coming from on, on this issue. And very recently, as the Islamic State has shrunk and lost members, and a lot of people have died, it's lost territory, more and more people are leaking very crucial information online. So we've seen a lot of new documents that have come out that have shed a lot of light on what I tend to call ideological infighting in the group. And ideological infighting generally focuses on tech fear. That is, as Omar said, to declare someone to be a kafir or an unbeliever. And uh, it's really wrecked havoc on the group. Uh, it's uh, led to executions of people. Currently, the so-called Mufti of the Islamic State is imprisoned in eastern Syria. He's a Jordanian named Abu Yaqub al Baqtasi. And uh, by the end of my few minutes, hopefully, I can um, tell you why I think that is. Um, but first, I'll address just a couple of preliminaries. One has to do with the tech fear and the jihadi movement writ large. So most jihadi groups, including Al-Qaeda, have often had the reputation of being so-called tech fear, um, which is to say that they um, put undue emphasis on tech fear and they, they declare to be unbelievers, professed Muslims, um, including all societies. And um, it's not an entirely warranted um, Reputation. There are. There's actually quite a good room for debate in the movement over the boundaries uh, of Tukfir. So while all of these groups can agree, for example, that the rulers of Arab states that do not, in their view, implement Islamic law, that they are unbelievers. Um, when it comes to the rest of society, there's there's lots of debate. Um, there's also debate over the um, the Islamic status of different theological groups. Um, so. For Shia, for example, ISIS declares them to be unbelievers. Al Qaeda generally holds that the masses of the Shia are excused their, as it were, theological shortcomings um, and that they should not be killed. And there's a famous letter from Ayman Zawahiri to Abu Musab al Zarqawi in 2005 where um, Zawahiri essentially tells Zarqawi, you, you can't just kill Shia masses because they're, they're excused their, their, their errors. Um, obviously, Zarqawi didn't see it that way. He continued to prosecute the sectarian war. Um, and that, that divide is still on display between Al Qaeda and ISIS um, to this day. So, Al Qaeda is somewhat less tech fear prone. Al Qaeda, uh, uh, sorry, repeat that. Al Qaeda less tech fear prone. ISIS more tech fear prone. You probably know that. There's also like right wing within ISIS. Like, ISIS yeah. is extreme, but they also have an extreme wing with them. Yeah, yeah I, if, you, if you just allow me to explain just the background about Takfir. Some researchers think that Takfir began with Muawiyah and the fight between Ali and Muawiyah. And just today is the 40 days of the uh, assassination of Hussein. And it's been like 14th century. But we have like uh, uh, historical evidence that Takfir began after the death of the Prophet Muhammad when the first caliph, Abu Bakr Siddiq, uh, started fighting against uh, the tribes who refused to pay taxes. And they were called Murtadis, because they refused to pay the taxes that they used to pay to the Prophet. Their agreement was with the Prophet. And it's from that time they started to declare Muslims as disbelievers. And they started executing or fighting, even like launching offensives against tribes. But this being like for just like a specific, a certain context, historical context and certain place. But this was much more uh, uh, exploited and used by jihadist groups and became more about the division between two lands, the land of Islam and the land of Kuffar, or uh, yeah, land of Islam and land of Kuffar. This is how they divide the war according to their interpretation of Islam. And the problem is that declaring Muslims non-believers wasn't just about Muslims, but what they say, everyone living in the land of Kuffar, they don't want to target them, they don't want to kill them, but they are allowed to kill everyone there. There is no punishment against them. It's easy to kill. And this is how Al-Qaeda interpreted Islam in 9-11. They knew that they were innocent people, and they knew that they were targeting civilians. But in their interpretation of the land of Islam, takfir allowed them 
to kill even Muslims living in that uh, land. No, that's important. Um, related to that is there, there's a statement from the Prophet um, that says, this is essentially his discouraging takfir, and a lot of um, historians and scholars believe that there was a proliferation of, of statements warning against takfir because in early Islam there was so much of it. Um, there were so many um, ideological, theological divisions. So the Prophet said, if a man says to his brother, oh unbeliever, ya kafir, it redounds upon one of them. That biha uh, um, So that is kind of what's one theological imperative in, in Sunni Islam, um, where you're not supposed to declare others to be unbelievers. Um, and in the Islamic State, in the, the jihadi world, there's another, however, a contending imperative, which actually holds that it is a duty upon you to declare people to be unbelievers. Um, and this idea, um, essentially, the, the duty of takfir. It's most closely associated with Wahhabism, that's the, the movement that arises in Saudi Arabia in the 18th century. Um, and it even can be traced to a single line in an epistle by the founder of Wahhabism, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, which is the source of a great deal of debate and controversy in ISIS today. So in this particular line is this, whoso does not make tech fear of the polytheists or is doubtful about their unbelief, or affirms the validity of their doctrine is an unbeliever by consensus. So, man lam yu kafir al mushrikeen or shakka fi kufrihim or sahaha madhabahum kafara bil ijma'ah. And, uh, it's, it's, it's an obligation to declare what who is supposed to be an unbeliever as an unbeliever. It's not, because it's also in Islam there is something that you keep it in your heart, but there's something you are obliged to declare it. You have to say that this is this person is uh, this believer, and you have to take the rules in the aftermath of this, or as a consequences. What's also most most dangerous about takfir as a political tool is being used against individuals and also against the groups of people, against individuals. When they declare someone is a believer, his wife should be divorced from him. His children should be deported from him. All his belongings should be taken away from him, and he should be killed. And also, shouldn't be buried in the lands of in the land of Muslims. And this is what, like, ISIS did this exactly in Musa. What they did when they killed, executed, what they call them, murtadin or apostas or kafirin. They left them uh, uh, in in places like to, to the dogs to eat them because they are not clean enough to be buried in the Muslim cemeteries. So that, that's why it's dangerous. And if you disagree with this, you are also considered kafir. So, but other level of takfir is they are declaring a whole group of people as kafirin, and they are also, like, you can easily kill them. And this is what ISIS during, or Qaeda during Zarqawi. You mentioned Zarqawi, and he was killing too many Shia, to the extent that Zawahiri in Afghanistan sent a message to him, telling him, like, stop, you are killing too many Shia. Then Zarqawi replied to him in another letter, telling him, like, you don't know the context of Iraq. We have to kill them. We have to declare this war against Shia because we want to tell the Sunnis that this is the only way to protect yourself. So it's being like used as like politically uh, uh, declaring uh, uh, groups as non-believers, killing them all, and taking this from a local level also to a global level. And that's why uh, ISIS or Daesh or other jihadist groups is dangerous. It's also dangerous because you don't need uh, an office, you don't need a certain place to declare others as non-believers. You just need someone who can study uh, the Islamic uh, historical and religious text. You just need some followers. You need this status of mufti. It's a, like a kind of like you can call him a judge, but uh, uh, much more yeah, Ali, much more like uh, yeah, he. he he has much more knowledge than anyone else in Islam. And once he say, like, 
This is the fatwa that declares this group of people as non-believers. Everyone should follow it. And that's why, and also another thing gave ISIS this political power as political tool, is that they declared the caliphate. So they had the power over jihadist groups, other jihadist groups who are also fighting against what they call the kuffar. They were also considered as kuffar by ISIS. So ISIS had this power over everyone, over Muslims, non-Muslims, Christian, other uh, uh, people. Everyone who doesn't follow ISIS will be considered as kafir, and as a consequence, he will, these people will be killed. And this happened in Syria, and it's still happening, because they think that all the Muslims should, be, uh, uh, should follow the caliph, because he is the appointed one, he is the representative of the prophet. And this gave them this political tool in Syria, in Iraq, what's happening in Libya now, also in Africa, and in Afghanistan. And there is kind of like fight between Qaeda and the, uh, ISIS now. The problem of this is that Islam itself let, left this very dangerous tool open to the interpretation. Anyone can interpret Islam in their way, and anyone can use it. And the other problem with Islam is the other groups, like everyone is asking al Azhar in Egypt, why don't you appoint, why don't you declare ISIS as kuffar? They say we can't, because once they declare ISIS as non-believers, they will simply do what ISIS is doing. So this kind of like conflict, I don't know how you can explain this, the like conflict between what they call them moderate Islam and extremist Islam. And ISIS can declare others non-believers, but they can't declare ISIS as non-believers. Yeah, it's definitely controversial. Even in, um, in Saudi Arabia, there's only a handful of scholars who have been willing to be there to take fear on the Islamic State. And those people got a lot of attention from the Islamic State itself um, in refutations. One thing I wanted to touch on was what you call the right wing yeah. faction. Yeah. ISIS. So ISIS is very much a tech fear prone organization, but it has had um, different factions within it, and some who are um, even who, who would draw the boundaries of the faith even more narrowly than, than Abu Bakr al Baghdadi would. Um, so the way I've been understood this from a lot of the leaked documents is that it's gone through two phases. So in, in 2014, there was a group primarily of Tunisians led by a man named Abu Jafar al-Hattal, you heard of him? Yeah. Who, um, who basically um, adhered to a doctrine that's called takfir in adha which means that you, you have to make takfir of people, even those who um, hesitate or make excuses for not uh, doing takfir of others. So if there's somebody who we, if person C, um, there's a dispute over whether he's a kafir, and person B says, well, I'm not going to make takfir of him because um, because he could have some, he could be ignorant or have some other interpretation. Person A will say, well, I have to make takfir of both of them. And so it's called chain takfir or takfir b to sensul. I like to call it uh, um, takfir infinite regress. So these people basically believe that the boundaries of the faith are really, really narrow. And um, what seems to, seems to have happened in, in 2014 is that uh, Atab and his group uh, were fed up with the um, moderate Islam of, of ISIS, as, as they understood yeah. it. And essentially, they rounded up, and Atab and his ilk were executed. Um, and it seemed that the, the problem of the right-wing faction had, had gone away for a couple of years. Um, what happened in 2016 um, is that a, a new um, kind of group of factions starts to emerge. So you have the most um, right-wing tech theory part of the group that is concentrated in the media department, or the DWEN and the ADAM, and um, they are in the business of putting out the weekly newsletter by the Islamic State, and they are pronouncing tech fear on people like Hassan al -Benna founder of the Muslim Brotherhood, and they even don't want to say things like, God have mercy on him when they talk about certain scholars from the 13th century, because they think that those people committed theological errors. Um, and on the complete opposite side, so on the most, you might say, um, tech fear adverse part of the organization, um, that was represented by 
uh, a group called the Office of Research and Studies, or Mektab al Buhoth wa Dirasat. And the man in charge of that was a Bahraini named Turki al Bin Ali, who Omar oh, so personal. Yeah, had the pleasure of uh, <laughs> a sermon from. Um, so, yeah, but the, this crazy thing is that uh, Turki al Bin Ali would, would emerge to be the, the moderate figure in, in ISIS, um, even though the man is, is you know, by standards of Sunni Islam writ large, a, a crazy extremist. Um, and in the middle of this, this dispute was what is called the Lejna al Mufawada, or the Delegated Committee, which was kind of balancing between both sides. And in 2016, the Delegated Committee put together a commission to, um, to interview and investigate the theological views of the scholars in, in the Office of Research and Studies and in the various um, wilayats or, or provinces. And they came to the conclusion that these people are just too moderate. They have far too nuanced a view of Takfir. Um, for example, in Bin Ali, um, he doesn't believe that um, everyone who participates in elections election is necessarily to be subject to tech fear. That person might just be ignorant, or you might be voting for an Islamist. Um, people who use non-Islamic courts to, to kind of recuperate a loss, that person might not be uh, a Catholic. So those kinds of issues, they attracted um, a lot of controversy. And um, ultimately, they led to the issuing of a memorandum on tech fear that was put out by the Islamic State in May 2017. Um, which seemed to side with the, the more radical faction in the group. And that the most, um, the, the most controversial line in that memo was that Tekfir is one of the manifest principles of the faith, min usul ad-din al-zahira, which means that there is no room for disagreement on anything, any, who is a kafir and who is not. And so Ibn Ali, and his allies, they all wrote refutations of the, of the memorandum. And this is the first time in several years where all of a sudden these, these groups just started leaking everything on Telegram. And I had access to all of these different um, refutations and um, it was fascinating. And what happened is within two weeks, Bin Ali had been detained in eastern Syria and he was killed in a drone strike. Um, and in the next two months, Several more scholars who had written these refutations, they also were being detained in eastern Syria and were killed in drone strikes. So the conspiracy theory among a certain faction of ISIS is that uh, the delegated committee, was led by a bunch of extremists in tech fear, wanted to kill the more moderate-minded scholars, and that they succeeded in doing so. Um, so this is just one part of how, how messed up things are in the group right now. They are always suspecting this, that Bin Ali, just a background of this uh, uh, leader with ISIS, he is the one who led the uh, alliance, like he ordered the people to pledge alliance to Baghdad after he announced his caliphate in Mosul, and he is who was leading this uh, campaign. He also wrote this Muddil Ayadi, raise your hands to pledge alliance to Baghdad. And he appeared in Mosul, he was moving between Iraq, uh, Egypt, Libya, and then he was killed in, like, his followers still believe that ISIS gave up him, and they kind of like, they didn't want him. It's just like, reminds me of Game of Thrones, when they don't want someone, they send him somewhere, or they send him to the battlefield, and they get killed, because they just don't want him. The this, guy had, yeah. had a lot of prestige. Yeah. Right? So this this political tool of ISIS, like it, from my from my opinion, is very dangerous. Yes, it's been like very extreme, being used by ISIS, even divided the extremist groups into like imagine that you call a group within ISIS as a moderated group, but this is just within the extreme circle. They are moderate in regard with the other uh, wings of ISIS. This is a very like important thing to look into of how to how to deactivate this tool also within ISIS and other groups because it seems that only ISIS is using this but if the Muslim Muftis or other higher uh, like authority in Islam would at once declare ISIS as non-believers and this is kind of like uh, they use Ishtihad 
They have the, the authority to issue a fatwa based on a certain context, based on a certain place, and declaring that ISIS is, or the whole group of ISIS, or everyone who wants to join ISIS are disbelievers. So if this would happen, like, we know that there is a, a, a war on terrorism, but without having the authority of Islam itself against ISIS, like, there is no battle that can defeat ISIS. Because the fight is really is the infight between ISIS and the other jihadist groups. Because they, have, they still hold the authority of Islam. And the fight between the jihadist groups is over the authority. Who is going to be leading Islam? And let's not forget that if uh, ISIS declared the caliphate and they had the power, and there were many Muslims that didn't believe in this caliphate, let's not forget that the caliphate is still coming. Because the moderate Muslims who have nothing to do with ISIS, who are not involved in this extremism, they are still waiting for the prophecy of the Prophet that Caliphate is coming. Because Caliphate is the final uh, shape of uh, political Islam after the Prophet and the four Caliphs and then the Umayyad, Abbasid and other Caliphs before the Day of Judgment. Uh, the caliph should appear. Uh, yes, this is what ISIS uh, uh, proclaimed, but it wasn't accepted by Muslims. At the same time, they couldn't refuse ISIS. They were kind of like in a conflict. They don't know what to do because it's much more about the authority. Who has the authority in Islam, and especially in Sunni Islam, the Sunnis themselves, they don't know. And as I said, like a guy, like probably he, is aged 25 years old. He sits in a corner in a mosque reading uh, uh, Islamic books. He can issue a fatwa, he can be a mufti, he can be followed by millions of Muslims. Easy. And he can say all the Iraqis, for example, are kuffar because they fought or they refused the Islamic State. And then their followers blindly can kill everyone because he showed he showed the authority that he has knowledge of Islam and he can do it. That's why uh, uh, Sunni Islam is still struggling with uh, many issues. One of the issues like, should they practice elections? Should they join government? What's the difference between uh, uh, political Islam and democracy? What's happening? What happened in, in Egypt, as an example, when Morsi took power and he he couldn't combine between Islam and democracy. He said, "I will not follow the constitution. I will follow uh, the Islamic law." And you are ruling uh, uh, different groups. We are not in uh, um, in an age where you can rule people according the Sharia to the Sharia law. So people protest against him and they talk over the authority. This is also the problem of political Islam. It can be explored by, as you say, this Bahraini guy, by someone sitting in the mountain, hiding there, by someone who is uh, not Arab, he has nothing to do with uh, the uh, chains of, of caliphate, because you might know that the caliph should be a descent of the Prophet's family, Mullah Omar in Afghanistan, he was called Amir al the, the leader of uh, believers. So that's why takfir is so easy to be used, but at the same time, it's also an effective tool against the jihadist groups. I don't know what, what you think of this. Uh, I, I, mean, I think that there's no simple solution. So yeah, if that's not to come out and say ISIS are all kufar, you know, as a group and as individuals, yeah. I'm not sure that that would actually help. Because yeah. um, then, by according to Islamic law, all of those people who have now been subject to that fear also have to engage in something called istitel, or they have to seek repentance from having committed unbelief. Um, that's not really uh, a good way for many offenses. Um, so mutual tech fear has its, its, its own problems. But um, I think that, as you were telling me, um, we were talking before, we found growing up in Mosul that there was kind of undue emphasis on 
on what counts as, as kufr and what counts as Islam growing yeah. up, and that there seems to be a problem with, with this focus on on unbelief and you know, what leads to unbelief and what groups belong and unbelief. Um, you know, when I was growing up as a, a nominal Protestant, I never learned why the Catholics are not uh, believers. Um, so yeah. I think that uh, you know that that kind of progress, as it were. Yeah, it's, it's also part of like another problem of the education. Like as a child, like not only me, many other uh, children in, in like I'm talking about Mosul or other Sunni or Muslim cities. Like the first thing you learn when you are a child is the three principles of Islam. And once you learn these three principles of Islam, the Sufi, the Sufi, written by founder of Wahhabism. Yeah, that's the, the three principles. Once you learn them. You will be eligible to declare others as non-believers, but you can't do this until you become 18 years old. Like you are aware of this when you are 10, but you don't have the authority to declare others. You just you are just aware of like you know that this is unbeliever. But once you are 18 years old, at this time, if you don't declare others as non-believers, here you will be punished by God. In the day after the, after the day of the judgment, uh, if there is like a call from uh, the uh, jihadist groups or the caliphate, if the caliphate is there, if they, if they call you to join or to declare others, and if you refuse, you will also be subjected to takfir. You will be out of Islam, out of this land of Islam, and then all the consequences, as as I said, it's death taking everything from this man or from this group. So it's also part of the education. Like, imagine that a government based on democracy, about Iraq speaking, a government based on democracy, like this is what they are teaching in the schools now. Like, look, no, I'm not talking about what ISIS tried to teach children. This is what we study, what we teach our children in the schools. Like, they are, they are learning this from their childhood, they know that who is kafir, who is not. They know this kind of division of Islam, like you have different groups. Uh, they are unaware of other groups living with them. So it's kind of like social, political, economical problem growing up in these communities. But it's kind of like too late to deal with it because we will need to wait for another two generations to start over start like stopping these three principles of Saudi Arabia or like of Wahhabism because I also know like uh, these principles much more extremely being uh, given to students I, I saw a documentary about Saudi Arabia they are talking about like he's a child he's like six years old he know who is kafir he know what consequences would come if you are Non-believer, like he's just six years old. Imagine what he will learn when he grow up. Uh, at the same time, the other part of Islam, which is considered moderate Islam, I always focus on this. It's so weak. They don't have the political tools. They are kind of uh, dealing with these governments, uh, with dictatorships. They always try to remain with this dictatorship. And you, you told me also about another part of Salafism or Wahhabism, they are protecting the regimes. The, well, this is the same, or they are called Jamis, yeah. right? The Jamis, uh, they are fighting on the side of the Saudi Arabia against Yemenis. And some of them like are fighting with Al-Qaeda in Saudi Arabia to protect the regime. Because it doesn't matter to them, whatever you do, this regime, if he is dictator, whatever he is doing, he should remain in, in the power because they don't want to go for like chaos or he is representing representing the the word of God or this like they use this kind of, they are interpreting Islam in a different way. They use there is a verse in Islam like you should follow God, his prophet and his representative. Since we don't have a caliph, so the representative is the king or the president of certain Islamic country. So they should protect this. And they can also declare 
declare ISIS or other jihadist groups who declare them kuffar, they can also declare them as non-believers. So these kind of like extremist groups uh, working with a government or other groups working against the government. You have other moderate groups like Azal Azhar. They are so weak to deal with this issue. They don't have authority. Uh, Muslims are also kind of like you have one of the problems of Islam is that we have Turkish Islam, we have Malaysian Islam, uh, Asian Islam, we have Moroccan Islam, we have Iraqi Islam, we have Egyptian Islam, we have Syrian Islam, we have like Islam of uh, uh, immigrants, like the European Islam, we have the American Islam, all these kind of like different divisions of Islam gave groups like ISIS the authority to do this or to use this as a very effective political tool. Because when you talk to Muslims, they said, who should we follow? They don't know. ISIS gave them this. ISIS gave them the option like, here is a caliph, you can follow the caliph. And that's also one of the reasons why many jihadists from Europe, from other uh, uh, foreign countries than Iraq and Syria followed the ISIS. Because ISIS gave them the option. Just to pick up on something you said, so I, I totally agree that there's something of a crisis of authority yeah. in Sunni Islam and these institutions that have traditionally had a lot of, of cachet in society, such as Al-Azhar, um, even some of the universities in, in Mecca and Medina, they no longer have that. And so um, it's led to a kind of democratization yeah. of, of authority that allows um, anybody who, um, who reads the three principles um, to kind of become his own mufti. Um, one thing, and that's encouraged in, in early Wahhabism, there's a movement against the, um, the established authority of, of the various schools um, in Islamic, um, not necessarily, they weren't against Islamic law, but they were against the people who were uh, kind of seen as, as holding the keys, they were the gatekeepers of the, the scholarly institutions. Um, but what's happened in, in ISIS very recently um, with the imprisonment and the detention of several scholars is that there are actually being comparisons made um, between, with some jihadis I follow online, there are comparisons made between ISIS and Saudi Arabia because them both are imprisoning their scholars. Um, and the idea is, so it's true that there's this crisis of authority and it leads to people like the jihadis having the ability to, to all pick up a pen and cast tech fear. Yeah. Um, willy nilly, but once you have actually, <coughs> you were, um, if you're in a group and you claim to have reconstituted the caliphate, that actually establishes yeah. uh, a center of authority. And the problem that a lot of these scholars in ISIS, um, I call them scholars because that's how they, they yeah. style themselves, they're older men. Um, they don't want to submit to the authority of people that they don't necessarily think um, ought to have religious yeah. authority because they grew up in an environment where religious authority is diffuse and they want to, to, to maintain that. Um, so that's why these, these, group, these people who will be the executive body of ISIS, the, the delegated committee, they can't stand the scholars who are leaking left and right all their, all their works and their fatwas and um, <coughs> they, they, they can't keep them in check. Um, so I think that it's going to lead to um, a serious defection in the future. And it, effectively, it already has, because you have a group that's been, since October 2017, publishing everything that the Office of Research and Studies has produced uh, since 2014. And the media um, department of the Islamic State is issuing statements to the effect that you capture, you, that these, these documents, even though they're some <coughs> written and oral <coughs> visual material, they don't represent the Islamic State in any way. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a chaotic, Yes. Well, I think we open the floor for questions. <coughs> Thank you very much for the presentation. I have uh, two questions. Can you elaborate on the uh, letter that, uh, or the impact of the letter that Bawahari uh, uh, sent to Baghdadi a couple of years ago, uh, in which he, he, I think he called him out for the madness of takfir. He said that, you know, you're going to berserk. Was there any impact? Did people leave the group? Was there any uh, uprising against them? <coughs> and the second question I have is, uh, do you think that this, this crisis of authority also, uh, with Umar also touched on that, uh, has 
there's some kind of connection to when Gamal Abdel Nasser nationalized the assets of Al Azhar and stripped Al Azhar's power, thereby taking away sort of the authority of one of the most important seats of power in Islam. And now Al Azhar has not recovered in the past 60 years. Do you think this is in any way connected to, to what's happened in the last few years? Uh, yeah, well just on the letter, so uh, yeah, Zawahiri, in, both in the, 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 the statement that he put out, essentially distancing Al-Qaeda from, from ISIS, um, he said many of the same things um, afterwards, too, in various statements. The guy gives more speeches than like, any jihadi leader in yeah. history, and no one pays any attention. Like, in August, he delivered, I think, four speeches that like, none made the lead. Yeah. He, he records more than one or nobody did something. <laughs> It's difficult to listen, but he uh, he he branded the um, he branded followers of the Islamic State Harajites, um, which is essentially to say that they are mad um, tech theories. Um, but I don't think that that actually had any uh, impact. It, it certainly the it had an impact that Zawahiri's stance, strong stance against ISIS, had an impact in preserving some of his um, his affiliates and preventing them from going over into the ISIS camp. So they're still pretty robust uh, Al Qaeda today, but I don't think that it convinced anyone to be nice. Yeah, actually, something related to this letter and how Zawahiri wanted to to prove to Al Qaeda, the mother of Al Qaeda in Iraq, he kind of convinced them that we are not targeting Shia just because they are Shia in Iraq. We are targeting them because they are the government. And this government is killing, uh, arresting, is destroying the Sunnis and their cities in Iraq. So he kind of convinced the Al Qaeda in Afghanistan that targeting Shia is important and is necessary in order to achieve the main goal of protecting Sunnis. There, there was kind of like conflict between different Qaeda wings in Iraq. Uh, they stopped fighting together. They kind of started targeting other groups. Other groups left Al Qaeda and joined uh, the Islamic Jihad or the Islamic Army. Uh, other Sunni uh, groups like Assad al Islam, the uh, uh, Kurdish affiliated Sunni jihadists. But at the, at the end, the uh, uh, Zawahiri wing won the battle, and this is how they turned on to be. Uh, the beginning of the Islamic State, because the Islamic State was declared in 2005, after the meeting they had with all the jihadist groups to uh, establish the Islamic State, and they published a book, the Alam al Islam, yeah, declaring the Islamic State. Yeah. And about al Azhar, I have studied the French occupation of Egypt uh, and Napoleon. Actually, al Azhar has been weak since that time, they didn't, couldn't do anything. Uh, Al Azhar became kind of like a prestigious uh, uh, authority. Uh, Muslim Brotherhood took the authority from Al Azhar. And Muslims would uh, uh, follow more Muslim Brotherhood version than the Al Azhar. Yeah. I agree. It doesn't carry the same. Yeah. It once did, being associated with the current state. Um, I'm sorry, it's not a question, but it's regarding the Sultan's question about the influence of uh, intellectual and public uh, universities and most of the other world. I'm just taking the case of the Zitun and Muslim Tunis, because you were talking about the, the groups coming from Tunisia, etc. So when Bolivar came to power in 1957, he wanted also to control uh, the power of the city. <coughs> Which is one of the oldest, the uh, most of the Western uh, Arab world, and one of the oldest university, where, which was, uh, which had another view of Islam and also the practice of the religion, and also the thinking, it was always a little bit Sufi oriented, very open mind, and they were doing a lot of research. And when Rogiba arrived to power, he tried to control the thinkers of the university and try to um, to dislocate this university to have more power, control this authority also because he wasn't like a believer, he wasn't a Muslim from Iraq and he uh, was agnostic and, and 
so when the revolution arrived and we saw also all these new, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, this new movement of uh, Muslim Brotherhood close to ISIS that sent basically the, this, uh, this young boy to, to Syria and you know, uh, a lot of people, a lot of thinkers thought about this problematic why we have closed uh, Zituna uh, University and it became very very contemporary as problematic as uh, uh, it, a lot of people consider it as a defense against extremism and uh, I just want to clarify this point to compare it with to last time was Special envoy for Syria. So my question is, within the Syrian context, whether you can elaborate a little, a little bit on the relationship or lack thereof, or the um, sort of capitalization of Daesh versus Jabal Nusra or HDS or whatever we had it had named and now have within the Syrian context. Uh, yeah, they they really hate each other. It's quite mild. They are Islamists, but. Uh, What's so fascinating about the case of ISIS and Jabhat al-Nusra is that um, there was a time when the leaders of, of both of those groups, so Abu Muhammad al-Jalani and Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, were working together and were on the same team. So a lot of the, the divisions that were kind of um, latent in, in, the, in the movement, in the jihadi movement, don't come to the surface um, until, um, until a push came to shove. So yeah, currently, as things stand, there is no... <coughs> my knowledge, there's no relationship between those two organizations, and there's no longer any crossover between people affecting from one to the other. Um, and there's even a, a hardline group in Al-Qaeda that believes that what it used to be Jabhat al Nusra now is called Hayat Tahrir Sham, HTS. They have also um, kind of left the fold of, of the jihadi movement because they have abandoned Al-Qaeda, they no longer have allegiance to him. So, I would actually say that HTS is two steps removed from ISIS now. Um, yeah. uh, much of what you've talked about so far has been, I think it's fair to say, about the elite opinion, about the leadership opinion. Uh, I wonder if you could say a bit more about how elite in opinion does or does not diffuse into mass opinion. So, I think. I think it's fair to say that, that ISIS wouldn't have been satisfied just to have the right policy implemented, but we want people to know about them and maybe to agree with them. So how did they make that happen or fail to? So the, I mean, I, I know more about elite opinion because <coughs> the elite, you know, they write and they produce documents. Um, so Omar, you probably can comment better on how that yeah. diffuses down to the lower level. I mean, regarding the... I mean, do people know about yeah. these debates? Yeah. They don't know necessarily about these debates, but what they need is the people need to follow someone. So they feel like the authority of Islamic State is so close to their opinions. There is another level of people, like from the public, they kind of aware of these debates, and they are part of it. They produce these opinions, and then it leads to another opinion, another level with the leadership. But there is another level of public. They know nothing about this. All they know is, in Islam, you should follow an authority because this leads to another like. Uh, hadith of the Prophet is Man mata walam yatba raya Whoever died without following a, a flag or it means without following an authority Islam he yeah. will meet as La bay'a fi uruqi He will die uh, as kafir So all Muslims are like in theory considered or supposed to follow a leader, whether this leader is extremist, whether this leader is uh, Sayyid Qutub, whether this leader is Hassan Banna or Bin Laden or 
Zarqawi or Zawahiri. This happened also in kind of like this crisis happened during the Abbas Caliphate in the 10th century of Islam. Yeah, 10th century. This crisis happened. You have a huge land of Islam from uh, Asia to uh, Morocco, and you have one caliph sitting in Baghdad, but you have other groups, they, they know nothing about this caliph in Baghdad. They know their local leaders. So they follow their local leaders because they need to follow. And this like this also produces another level of leadership in Islam is that is not only the caliph who is representing the Prophet, he also has representatives. So this kind of like led the Muslims to produce more leadership within their communities. So that's why I say it's more about the public opinion, they need the, 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 to follow, and this gave the power to leaders like Zarqawi or other leaders emerged in Islam to have authority over the public, over someone who was probably in the United States or far in Africa to follow someone living in the mountains in Afghanistan because he needs authority, he needs uh, uh, power to follow. Let me just um, try and <laughs> answer your question as it relates to the Islamic State so far as I can understand it. So the way that um, things seem to happen when it comes to releasing information is that everything is supposed to be very streamlined through the media department. So the media department thinks of itself as basically um, in charge and in control of what is official and what is unofficial. Yeah. Um, and so that is one reason why it's so upset that these scholars of the Office of Research and Studies are leaking um, their documents. Um, so one way that the caliph gets people on the same page, and he said this in his August 22 uh, speech um, from a couple weeks ago, he said that stop listening to reports that don't come from a, our official media. Yeah because they're going to mislead you. Um, so there's supposed to be a, a chain of, of authority. And so when that very controversial memo on Takfir was issued in, in May 2017, it was translated by the media department into several languages. It appeared in the weekly newsletter. Um, you know, it was all broadcast on social media. And then when it was retracted, um, this was in, so four months later, in September 2017, and there was an audio series that was supposed to replace it with a more moderate position on tech beer. That was transcribed and produced, at least one episode of it was transcribed and produced in the, the weekly newsletter. Um, and you have, and it was officially uh, released by Izzat al Bayan, the Bayan radio. Um, so there is a, a way that they're trying to kind of streamline um, and project authority uh, through proper channels. Kind of like sort of fascist. Um, yeah. Two final questions. Yeah. First of all, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm, I'm sorry for my ignorance about the topic, but I was thinking uh, uh, from Peru and from Latin America, when you talk about Iraq and you think about uh, Iraq, you remember the Taliban and uh, Al Qaeda is saying something, and uh, ISIS. Uh, and the question is, which are the structural reasons why these kind of things happen? Because when I think about Peru, for instance, we have been going to terrorism and now another problem. Um, those things, in my opinion, and I have the knowledge to say that, uh, is because of the state failure. It's because of the state that has been not able to give basic services to the people and basic opportunities to grow and to have a good thing. So why am I asking this question? Because maybe in the next 15 years, we're going to be here talking about a different group that is not Axis, but it's doing exactly the same things. And maybe it's really important to talk about the specifics, but also talk about what are the structure of the reasons that are there. In the case of Peru, narco trafficking exists because people <laughs> really love uh, having crops, uh, cover crops. Because they don't have opportunities, because they don't have education, because they don't have water, they don't have electricity, they don't have a way of, of uh, a living life. And with terrorism, it's exactly the same thing. 70,000 Peruvians died. 70,000 Peruvians died because of terrorism. 
Ali was not because of my theology. It was because there were people who were dying every single day because there were no way of living in the mountains of Peru in the highlands. But my question is, in your opinion, which are the structural reasons why this kind of things happen in the Middle East and particularly in Ireland? Yeah, I mean, of course it's like the same pillar, but <laughs> at the same time, you have jihadists who are holding PhDs. They are well educated. They are coming from, like, look at the jihadists from France. They were living, not all of them were living in a, in a, in a miserable life, but they were living a good life. It doesn't have to, to do ev like everything with the state failure. Of course, this is one of the main reasons. But Osama bin Laden didn't come from a failed state. He was well educated, uh, he comes from a very rich family, but he decided to go through this. The main problem of why jihadist or extremist emerge in Islam, especially in the Sunni Islam, is that the door is open to this. There is no authority in Islam. Muslims are waiting for the authority here to come. Like, as for the other part of Islam, Shia, they know who is their leader and they ha he has four representatives. They are still alive. If they die, other four will come. And they are still waiting for someone to come, who is called Al-Mahdi. But in Sunni Islam, the door is open. And the political crisis over, the, over Islam, the crisis over authority, uh, the different uh, groups, the different schools of interpreting Islam, along with the uh, economical crisis in these countries led to create these kind of groups. Religion was used as a political tool by the governments itself. So it gave also the, these jihadists to grow up within their environment. It doesn't matter uh, if the, the government is bad or good, or if the state is ruled by democracy or other. Like, let's give an example of Saddam. 30 years he ruled Iraq with like, this uh, iron hand. And Iraq wasn't like a failed state under his rule in terms of like economy, people were living kind of like a good life. But he was a dictator, and this dictatorship created this kind of monsters after 2003, the jihadists who emerged, uh, uh, the groups who started killing each other. It's more about who is holding the authority. And this is the main crisis of Islam. And this has been like discussed for more than 13 centuries you now. They are still discussing this. Who has the authority in Islam? We don't know. Um, just Please. to offer my two cents. Um, I'm not a political scientist. I don't want to do a disservice to the importance of structural uh, reasons. Um, but it seems to me that you have there are kind of two things going on. There's state failure, and then there's what fills the vacuum. Right? So currently, when there's state failure in the Middle East, what fills the vacuum is jihadism. But there's been state failure in the Middle East in the last century um, when when what filled the vacuum was nothing even close to jihad. In the 40s and 50s, there were, there were coups and revolutions in Syria, Egypt, and Iraq, and that didn't lead to, um, to jihadist groups uh, coming, to the, coming to the fore. So there's certainly um, a case to be made that the, the focus has to be on, on understanding the structural problems that enable something like jihadism to come um, to power. But also, one has to understand what are the you know, social, intellectual, and cultural uh, trends that are giving rise to, to this movement in the first place and making it so popular. And, uh, this, is, this is very interesting to someone who is not involved in uh, the religious aspect of uh, what's going on in the Middle East. I'm more concerned about how the United States is involved. And the question I have has to do with U.S. support for Saudi Arabia. I can speak of other things. The U.S. involvement in, in destroying the economy of Iraq or in supporting jihadists in Syria or overthrowing Libya and so forth. All of those things seem to me create a, a, a fertile soil for 
people who want uh, want not to be under bombs or under uh, you know the guns that are shooting at each other and so forth. But right now, one of the one of the main areas of interest, at least in the peace movement, is the Saudi uh, assault on Yemen. And the United States, with a few exceptions, the United States government and the Congress, are just supporting it or not saying anything about it and we're providing the weaponry and so forth. And we also understand, at least I understand in my limited knowledge, that the Saudis promote these religious schools around the world uh, that support Wahhabism and support this kind of uh, extremism. And yet the United States continues to support Saudi Arabia. Um, how, how important do you see the, the, the actions of the United States in Saudi Arabia, but you can certainly expand it? on keeping this extremism going. How many hours do you have? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just make the, the basic point. I think Saudi Arabia has made some actually, um, for the first time, really sincere efforts to stop funneling uh, the more extreme and intolerant versions of Wahhabism, uh, particularly in Europe. And the current leadership will not um, acknowledge, they will not admit that they have actually been contributing uh, to the problem um, of, of extremism in Islam, and that their religious tradition has anything to do with it. But what, what they're doing, in effect, is to, to kind of tame um, the, the worse, worser parts of it. Um, but what's, what's fascinating to me on, on this question of, of Saudi funding and for the promotion of Wahhabism or Salafism, um, the relationship between extremism, is that there are places where Saudi Arabia didn't have the ability to send money and funds, right? Because it had no relationship with the government. So Iraq, for example, um, how Wahhabism is being taught in Omar's schools in Iraq has nothing to do with Saudi funding. Yeah, I can't, I don't understand. Um, so to me, there, there's something larger going on in, in, in Sunni Islam that is um, kind of embracing a lot of Salafi and Wahhabi principles um, that might not be reducible to Saudi funding. Yeah. I mean, it's also about the United States and its policy in Middle East. It's much more about like the political mistakes being done by the United States. After 2003, like 2003 was a kind of like a mistake, but it was also an opportunity. Then they did another mistake after 2003 when they didn't have a clear plan of what would they do in Iraq? And this led to the merge of like jihadist groups. The, these jihadist groups had relations with the former Ba'athi uh, uh, members, with the former Iraqi army, those who lost their jobs. But at the same time, it had many things to do with the heritage of jihadism in Islam. Let's not forget that jihad is a main principle in Islam. And it's also connected to what I said previously about the authority in Islam. How US is involved in this is about the mistakes they did. Like they did another mistake in Iraq in 2011 when they decided to withdraw after all these crises happened in the country. If they are funding, they are involved uh, uh, directly with jihadist groups, I have nothing to do with this. I mean, I, do, I know nothing about this. Uh, one, one last question. Yeah. Okay. Oh, we have time. For, I'll make it. Yeah. I'll just make it yeah. really brief. Uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation. That's really great. Um, I, I wonder, you know, for for somebody that's not fully aware of everything that, uh, that's going on in our region, and we do have a lot of problems in our contemporary history uh, as, as it uh, pertains to is Islam. Um, I feel we we risk. We only focus on these groups' narratives that we risk uh, sidelining um, the, the majority of opinion uh, of the moderates. <laughs> that usually their voice don't get echoed, sadly, because 
the media won't, won't echo the modern voice. You know, it's always the loudest, craziest looking guy uh, that makes it to the headlines. And I wonder what's your take on, there was a letter in 2014, 2015, 32 page letter that was signed by the most prominent scholars and imams in the Muslim world, 132 of them signed it, denouncing ISIS and sent it to Baghdad. Uh, what, what is your take on that? And, and how did that play a role in, in reflecting the majority of the opening of the Arab Muslim world? How would that? I've read the letter to Baghdad, I've read some critiques of it. There's a critique by a historian um, who actually believes that the letter misrepresents a whole lot of things, particularly with regard to history of <coughs> slavery and Islam. Um, but uh, I don't know, I, I don't think that you're going to commit to convince a committed jihadist to change his ways with, with a letter signed by people that he doesn't respect. Yeah. Right? Um, I, I think that those are important efforts that they want to continue. There should be even more of them. There should be you know, a thousand letters to back that. Um, but uh, it's, when it comes to you know, who's going to join the movement, I'm not sure that that will actually have an effect. Yeah, I also read this letter. It's a very long one, and it has many mistakes, to be honest. And when it comes to, as you say, to convince a jihadist, to stop doing what he is doing. You have to provide him with practical solutions, and you have to provide him with the reasonable, like, things with, things that he should find, like, it's much more practical than what he is doing. Because he is being convinced that what he is doing is the right path of Islam. And the one who gave him this is a man of authority. When Baghdadi called or his followers to follow him, he had authority over them. Even though they knew nothing about him, even they don't, they don't meet with him personally, even they didn't shake hands with him because this is like, was one of the important things to do if you pledge alliance to him, but he had representatives. It's much more to like and what you said about the moderate Islam is not uh, uh, covered by media. It's because a very important reason. It's because they are weak and they are they don't have practical solutions to provide to the society, especially to the Muslim societies. Look at the Muslims in Europe. Their leadership is weak. Look at the Muslims in Middle East itself. Their leadership is divided, it's weak. Like, look at one country, like Iraq or Syria. How many Sunni groups do you have? There is no authority. Uh, Sunnis who look at Turkey as a leading Islamic country, they have also political problems with Turkey, so that this is kind of like going to stop them. So when this jihadist who is spending his whole life looking at uh, media reports. He is looking what ha what's happening in Rohingya, in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, in uh, any other country. When he look or compare between Al-Azhar and Al-Qaeda, he is of course going to go to Al-Qaeda or ISIS. He is not going to Al-Azhar to sit in uh, a room or in a mosque doing nothing. He will choose ISIS. It's more about practical solutions, and it's more about what, what uh, Fulia said about the state favor, and what is the state providing them with? Are they providing them with solutions? No. That's why it's easy for ISIS to recruit more people. Yeah. Uh, last one. Sorry. Right. Right out here. Yeah. Well, I wanted to bring one more piece into the puzzle. We haven't said anything about the foreign fighters. And you know, we have jihad as the big counter narrative now, you know, and whereas Sendero <coughs> Luminoso, even though it was people in the mountains that were tying bombs to kids and sending them to police, it was university professors coming to do that. You know. <laughs> it wasn't just the mountain people. 
so we have this influx, and I wonder if all the foreign fighters in ISIS has something to do with the death, with this right-wing faction that controlled the media, because they have this huge, they're controlling the foreign fighters, so they've got, they bring them in with this violent rhetoric, they've got to sh respond to it too, to keep control of them. So I wonder if that like pushed them somehow, as they pulled them in, they also have to live up to their word, I wonder if that also has something to do with the, the fraction, because I just look at the way they control the media, and I, that has to be the, the main thing. You have this outside force in there. Do you, as someone who was on the ground, it, it, it was just so cabined off, you wouldn't see this on the ground, right? Uh, the influence of the foreign fighters on the leadership. Well, the, foreigners, the foreigners were much more extreme than the locals, actually. Yeah. Like, I, I saw them, like I saw, a Dutch guy, he's very tall, he like has brown hair, he was eating falafel in Muslim, and he was like, like very extreme. He, he tried to kill someone because he saw him smoking. This is even before ISIS declared smoking is forbidden. And especially the French fighters, like, they were monsters. They were so extreme. Is it? But Ben Ali has a letter to the delegated community with complaints about it. First, the Tunisians. He said the Tunisians, they were responsible for the Hazmi issue. That's just the, the, the first phase of the, the tech fear wars inside ISIS. Um, and then they were kind of put in their place. And then, uh, secondly, it was the Saudis, he said, who were bringing with them two extreme ideas. Um, but also, I've looked at the backgrounds of all the, the, the scholars who represented a more moderate position, and they are from all sorts of countries, from Bahrain, from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt. Um, and then there's the, the most complaints that seem to come from, at least from the Bin Ali faction, are against the Iraqis, who are considered to be the, the most ignorant and the most fascist. Um, so, I think, I think that that is very much in play. Yeah, there's also, like, let, let's not forget that there is Syrian ISIS and Iraqi ISIS. They are kind of like different regarding the uh, leadership of ISIS because the caliph is Iraqi, uh, Baghdadi, and the spokesman who was killed, Anani, he was Syrian. So, this kind of, also, there was conflict between Syrian and Iraqi ISIS. But they also have different like schools within their structure. Hopefully they'll have more coffee. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank, you. Thank you so much.